I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, uh, a word about our sponsor, The Great Courses. Great Courses Plus is the app you can get on your phone. You just touch it like that, and it opens up to all their different courses. This is the teaching company's Great Courses, and this is the subscription uh, service in which you sign up for an uh, annual fee. And then, uh, just like Netflix or Hulu or any of the other streaming services, they stream the lectures for you. Uh, and here are some of the courses that just popped up today that I haven't seen our new courses more added every month. Uh, the Life and Works of Jane Austen, Music Theory, How to Speak Effectively, uh, let's see, How to Create Comics, John Lewis, Witness to History, This Day in History, uh, February, Learn in a Weekend, ooh, Mind-Blowing Science, that sounds pretty good, uh, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on like this, just uh, the courses just go on and on. And each one of these courses, I'm just scrolling through here, has uh, a dozen or two dozen lectures, each about 30 minutes long. And if you listen to them like I do at 1.2 speed, then it's about 20 minutes for a single lecture. So here's the deal. If you access this through, uh, sign up through my podcast, uh, you get $30 off the annual fee and uh, a free trial. So it comes out to about 10 bucks a month. That's even cheaper than Netflix. And you get really solid knowledge here. These are professionally produced in a studio lectures by professional scholars and academics and experts in their field. So here's the deal. You go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer, and you get a $30 off the annual fee, plus the free trial comes out to about 10 bucks a month, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Joshua Glasgow. His new book is The Solace, Finding Value in Death, through Gratitude for Life. Joshua is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Sonoma State University, where for several years he was also Director of the Center for Ethics, Law, and Society. He works on a variety of topics in ethics and political philosophy, and he's also the author of What is Race? Four Philosophical Views. So in the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so of the conversation, we get into race and the BLM movement and the history of racism in America and systemic racism versus specific instances of race. And, uh, but the primary point of this conversation is uh, life and death. And um, so we cover all the great uh, issues here. What does an atheist, humanist, non-believer say to a dying person if you're not able to offer them the promise of an afterlife? Uh, what do you say? So we get into some of that. Talk about Ricky Gervais's film, The Invention of Line, which uh, explores that topic in a humorous way. Uh, we start actually with Epicurus's dilemma, in which death is nothing to us since so long as we exist, death is not with us. But when death comes, then we do not exist. Yeah, well, some comfort that is if you're the dying person. <laughs> anyway, so then uh, we, we drill down onto the difference between being dead, dying, passing away, and you know, not close to that that uh, shadow lands there toward the end. And does it make a difference whether you go slow or fast? And uh, the idea of a natural time to die, when is that? Next week, next year, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, what would it mean anyway to live forever? It's just an, almost an inconceivable idea. What if you had, you know, 25 marriages and 50 kids and a thousand careers, or, you know, just longevity, uh, if you carry it out long enough, Maybe it's good to have a, a terminus to life. Anyway, a lot of people think that. Of course, we discuss Hitch and, and his, uh, some of his great lines uh, he wrote uh, in his essays when he was dying of cancer. And, uh, and then a little bit of wonderful life and, uh, and why how we affect other people's lives makes our lives count. And that if we're not there, uh, that leaves an awful hole in their lives. Anyway, it's a it's a super interesting, thoughtful conversation. Um, I thought um, before I started, I would read this a uh, couple paragraphs from my uh, essay called "The Shadowlands" that I wrote in two thousand four. It was published in Skeptic and then reprinted in my book um, "Science Frictions." Uh, it's about the death of my mother, but that gave me a uh, an opportunity to just write about this particular subject. So here it is. Behind every one of the 6.2 billion people now living, 
lie 17 others in the ground, for 106 billion is the total number of humans who have ever lived. Our future is sealed by our past. 60,000 years ago, in a cave 132 feet deep cut into the Zagros Mountains of northern Iraq, 250 miles north of Baghdad at a site called Shanidar, the body of a Neanderthal man was carefully buried in a cave on a bed of evergreen boughs, on his left side head to the south facing west and covered in flowers, so identified through microscopic analysis of the surviving pollens. Already in the grave were an infant and two women. The flowers were from eight different species, and the arrangement was not accidental. I should add parenthetically that some archaeologists think it is, but I still think it's a intentional burial site. Anyway, continuing. There was a purpose to the burial process. It is the earliest memorial celebration of life and mourning of death of which we know. Now that uh, Neanderthals are extinct, we are the only species who is aware of its own mortality. Death is an inescapable end to life. Every organism that has ever lived has died. There are no exceptions. Thus we are faced with the existential question that has haunted everyone who has thought about this uncomfortable fact of life. Why are we here? People throughout the ages and around the world and all cultures and communities have devised a remarkable variety of answers to this question. Indeed, anthropologists estimate that over the past 10,000 years, humans have created roughly 10,000 different religions, the wellspring of which may be found in answers they have offered to that soul-jarring question, why are we here? And then fast forward to the last paragraph of that essay. Too often, I think, we gloss over the messiness of living and the unpleasantries of life, particularly at the beginning and end, as if birth and death are shadowlands accessible only to a chosen few. We suppress or ignore some of the deepest and most meaningful events of the human condition. It is in those shadowlands, however, where we face the termini of life and share the full experience of the hundred billion who came before us and know authentically what it means to be human. Thank no, you. thanks for coming on the show. It's uh, it's a super important topic, and now that we're we're, we're past the uh, past four years of of uh, talking about nothing but politics, we can get back to uh, other important issues. Since uh, COVID nineteen has certainly taken its share, now we're up to four hundred thousand dead. People are having to deal with this topic, so I think your your book is is good timing. And I thought I'd I'd introduce the problem that you're I think you're trying to solve through my own little world of or maybe not so small world of, um, you know, what do you say, what does an atheist, humanist, non-believer type person say to someone who's dying? I mean, you can't just go in and go, well, you know, like the uh, he started off with Epicurus, you know, where Epicurus famously says, death is nothing to us since so long as we exist, death is not with us, but when death comes, then we do not exist. Uh, it does not then concern either the living or the dead, since for the former it is not, and the latter are no more. Well, I can't imagine somebody lying on their deathbed going, thanks a lot. That doesn't make me feel any better at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the problems in my in my view with Epicurus is that it's, uh, you know, it might, for somebody like me who's middle-aged and relatively healthy, you know, it, it might um, provide some sort of, ability for, for us to put off worrying about death or, or, or any kind of concerns about that. But I, I think that as an actual piece of comfort that you might call on as you're really staring down death, it's, it's going to be cold comfort to a lot of people or even alienating, right? Because it's uh, we, we start with the premise that death is not something we want. And the trick is to figure out why, I think, not to deny it. Yeah. Yeah. So to be clear, though, we you can't experience death because if you're dead, you're not experiencing anything. So there's something of a contradiction there. Uh, but you resolve it by saying, well, we, we need to talk about dying or the dying process or that that shadow lands between being fully uh, sentient and conscious and then lights out. And that's where the action yeah. is. Yeah, I think that's right. So, I yeah, I would say we should distinguish between the state of non-existence of just being, you know, being dead after you've died. Um, and then the process of dying, which can be, you know, we, we understand that we see that, as you said, you know, we, we don't really, um, the, the question is what happens in that, that shadowlands to use your, your wonderful, um, evocative word there, um, between, you know, that 
phase into dying and then that moment when we actually pass away. And that's, I think, yeah, that's the, that's the moment I want to focus on the event I want to focus on. Yeah. For, for, so, for sure. so this is a personal journey for you. You had tried to have this conversation with your mom or you wanted to in, in your own mind, but, uh, but, but you, you waited a little too long. And so by the time you get to the end, it's, it's a pretty touching story. So just start, start there. Uh, this, the motivation for this book was this conversation you wanted to have with your mom. Yeah, I was actually um, writing this stuff before my mom got got sick with cancer or before we knew she was sick at any rate. Um, and um, I was working on it. I was trying it in different forms. And uh, well, you're a you know, very prolific writer. You know that um, writing can sometimes be a laborious process to get it. And, and it wasn't working for me. And then when my mom did get diagnosed, um, my actual professional work started merging with my you know personal life in a pretty profound but also concerning way and so right i wanted to have a conversation with my mom my mom was clearly when she was diagnosed with cancer she was clearly troubled by death uh she clearly you know she didn't really want to talk about it um she didn't want to know her prognosis she didn't she told her doctor don't tell me really don't tell me how long i have left don't tell me my odds I'm just going to live. And so for me to talk to her about it was really difficult. Um, she didn't want to have the conversation. And of course, I wanted to respect that. And so the book is in many ways me, you know, on one track, trying to resolve how I think about death and on another track, trying to have a meaningful conversation with my my mother, you know, and what would have been one of our last conversations. And um, yeah, that, that, you know, I was able to work through how I thought about death and how I think about death now to this day. But um, yeah, the conversation was fits and starts and never, never really took off. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it that people don't want to know how long they have to live? Uh, let's, I mean, just, just think about that for a second. Would you want to know, like, if you got the 23andMe test that you have Huntington's disease, and you're going to die 100%. You know, a lot of people, they don't, they, they don't tick the box for that or for al the Alzheimer's test. I did. I did that. I took all the tests because I want to know. But, but the more I read, I see most people are not like that. They don't want to know. Yeah, you know, this is interesting. I think there's a broader, I think philosophers like me and skeptics like you, you know, we have this drive to really get all the answers that we can get. But, you know, when I talk to my intro students, my freshmen at, at college that, that I teach at, uh, we talk about what's intrinsically good and we come to knowledge eventually after getting past pleasure and other things. And um, I ask them often, like, if you knew your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner was was cheating on you, would you want to know? Mm. And I'm always astounded at how few people want to know. Really? That's <laughs> There's a lot of people out there who would really just rather stay in their lane and not be distracted by unpleasantries. And I guess I guess death must work, you know, in the same way, of course. But I don't I don't know. I mean, what, do you have? Well, any uh, as, to well are... as we're talking, I just had a thought. I guess I wouldn't want to know the day. Like if there was some test and it was going to be, uh, I don't know, October 23rd, uh, 20, let's say I, I was born in 54. So let's make it 44, <laughs> you know, 2044 on October 23rd. Put it a long way out. Lights out. Yeah, that's long way out. That's far enough away now. I wouldn't think about it too much. But as we got closer, I'd be thinking, oh, crap, the, the, the day's coming. In that sense, I guess I'd rather just go about each day not really knowing. Knowing it's going to come, but not knowing exactly when. Maybe it's a version of that. Yeah, I think I think there's something to that. Although part of me would love to know when I would. I mean, think how efficiently you could plan your the rest of your mm. life if you mm. knew I've got this window and I've got this many things I want to do or people I want to interact with or um, books I want to read or whatever the thing is. And um, I, I kind yeah. of like the idea of knowing that. But then again, it might be just absolutely terrifying. If, Actually, that's a good yeah, point because people not. that okay. people that have a near death experience—I don't mean the out of body stuff, but I mean they almost die—they get super motivated uh, and recharged and have a new energy for life. Or people that are given a diagnosis, they start hustling. Like this famous case of Stephen Hawking—you know, oh, I got to finish my PhD because uh, I got a, a wife and, and a family, and I got to support him. You know, and then fifty years later, you know, he was still going. Uh, but you know, but maybe that's, maybe that's what it is. It's a motivating thing. So t t let's talk about for a moment then that, that idea, that's kind of one of these philosophical ideas. I, I forget who, uh, talks a lot about, about this, but, but having a terminus to life gives life meaning. 
and therefore the idea of living forever would reduce the meaning of life. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you mentioned that a little bit, but, uh, but how philosophers think about that. Yeah, some, some do. I, I'm, I mean, I, I definitely see the uh, logic to that. And I do think that, you know, a lot of the episodes we live through, including maybe our whole lives, are given meaning by having an endpoint where it kind of wraps up the story. I mean, there's some philosophers who don't like this talk of life having a story and, and whatnot, but I, I do. And, I, and, and I, um, I firmly believe that having an ending to the story can help. But, you know, depending on what I guess, depending on what you think gives life meaning, I'm not sure that's essential. So, for example, um, you know, maybe the most popular view of meaning in life amongst my colleagues, the people who do philosophy for a living, uh, is, is, and maybe made most famous by Susan Wolf, is the idea that, you know, you get meaning in life when you're involved in a relationship or a project that is objectively valuable. It really is valuable. So it's not a waste of your time. And also it's something you're genuinely enthused about or drawn to in some way. And if that's the case, um, this is where I think John Martin Fisher has made a good point about having that endpoint not really being necessary. I mean, you could churn through experiences like that have that feature where it's you're doing something that's objectively valuable, say, you know, spending time with a loved one, and it's something you really want to do. And that kind of uh, meaningful experience, I, I think, could go on indefinitely. I mean, I'm concerned to make proclamations about what life would be like as an immortal, as, as you know, you know, <laughs> talk about this a bit in the book, that it's, it's so foreign to us that yeah. I don't know if I would still find it meaningful or be drawn to it after millennia, you know, or right. whatever, you know, after trillions of years, would I still be in, <laughs> would, would love still keep the fires burning? I don't know. But um, it, in principle, it seems possible. So, yeah, I, I, while I'm, an end, I think, can provide a kind of meaning, I guess I don't, I, I'm not yet sold on the idea that it's required for having meaning. in life. Yeah, I think I must have first encountered that when I was uh, dealing with the cryonics people and who I'm fascinated by because they're super pro science and technology and uh, you know they want to live forever and so on okay uh, but the main objection to them by uh, sort of non-scientists that would hear about it is like that's not natural it's it, 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 we should we should die we have to die it's natural to die dying is you know okay w w what's the length you know because these guys want to extend it maybe 200 years or 400 years no that's too long okay what's the number? Well, I don't know, and usually the number in surveys are is whatever the current life expectancy is. So let's say eighty-two. All right, how about when you're a week away from being eighty-two, and I ask you, would you like to live an extra month? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Just get just one more month, and then you go out twenty-nine days. Okay, tomorrow's the day. Oh, can I have a couple more weeks? You know, I just got a few more things to do, and that would that would never end, presumably, if you were happy and, and healthy. So do the cryonics folks that you've spoken to, they actually want, they sort of want to test the concept. They want that endpoint so that they can. Well, they, they don't, don't put know, a, they, can then, they don't put a hard number on it. They just, they don't want to say forever, um, you know, because, you know, we don't even know if, if, if it's workable at all. Uh, just that uh, they don't like thinking of death uh, as the end point, but rather it's just another disease that needs to be cured and we don't have the cure for it right. yet. So we're going to delay your demise until we have the cure for whatever killed you. And you just keep doing that and you get to live whatever, 500 years, a thousand years or something like that. But, yeah. you know, there are people um, like Aubrey de Grey who thinks in principle you could keep the system going as long as you fixed all the mutations and errors and the cellular decay and you were to replace the... Um, uh, the chromosome tips, the uh, telomeres, and and on and on. But but right. the problem is, there's like a thousand things you'd have to do simultaneously, indefinitely, and you know entropy just takes its course on complex systems like ours, and it just runs down. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, not. I mean, as, as you've argued in 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 uh, in your book, Heaven Heavens on Earth, that we're a long way away from that. Right? It's not going to solve our problem. No, it's not going to solve. No, no, not going to solve. We we still need uh, still need your book to get us through because none of us are going to make it there. Yeah. Um, but also reading that I first chapter, that first or second chapter of your book, I got to thinking: wouldn't it matter whether you go slow or fast uh, about that dying versus being dead? 
You know, like my dad, for example, died of a heart attack. He was in his car in a parking lot with the motor running on his way to work. So we kind of reconstructed that. He must have had severe chest pain, pulled over, put it in park, and then boom, lights out. Uh, and, and it's like, okay, so he's driving along. Life is good. He's happy. And, and then it, it's over. Versus like my mom, you know, she had tumor, brain tumor. This went on for 10 years. And it's like, Jesus Christ, come on. That's, maybe that's too long. Maybe the, you know, just lights out is the way to go. So that whole discussion of that shadow lands up between living and, and death while dying, it's, much of it depends on how long it takes or how much suffering you're going through. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, and I mean, so we, we know, right, that 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 years and years of of suffering um, can be difficult. It can, we can find solace there too, probably, but it can be incredible. I mean, watching my mom in the last couple of years was, you know, a pretty steady decline, and it's it's brutal to go through, and it's brutal to watch somebody you love go through also. Yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of you know palliative kind of recommendations for for that or, or thoughts because i'm really focused on just that technical notion of that one moment at the end whether the end takes um you know years or moments um it's only that last moment that i that i really that i really think um the philosophical problems hang on and so if the problem is you know can death be bad for us and if with epicurus you say well you know, no, death's not bad for us because we don't exist. That doesn't really address the problem of, well, what about that final instantaneous moment, however long dying takes, that final moment? Um, what about that? Couldn't that be bad for us? And it seemed that's where that's where I want to pick up the thread and 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 say, yeah, I could because, uh, and this is not me. This uh, I think a lot of people credit this to Thomas Nagel. Oh yeah, you know the idea that well. That, that that moment deprives us. Um, actually, for Nagel, it wasn't in that moment, but um, for me, it's in that moment. We are we are deprived and therefore harmed. Um, we are deprived of everything that we could have had tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And um, so that's that's where I think that that one slice of time. I don't even know if it's a slice of time or if it's as I say at the end, like a seam between two different slices of time. Yeah. But um, that that little tiny instant uh, where where we where the lights go out. Um, that that's where the philosophical conundrums come up and where they can be solved. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what you're going to be deprived of by dying would make then the death of a younger person worse than the death of an older person because they have more to lose. They do, although there's some puzzles here, too. I mean, uh, people like Ben Bradley and Jeff McMahon have really done a lot of work to expose those. There's all these puzzles about yeah, it seems like a 20-year-old loses more than an 80-year-old. And so we want to say that because that's more deprivation, it's worse to die at 20 than at 80. And I think that makes a lot of sense. But if you go back earlier to, say, a newborn infant, I mean, would you rather have somebody die as a newborn infant or as a 20-year-old? Hmm. In that case, you might rather not get projects underway, right? The 20-year-old has a death that's tragic in their own way that a, that a baby or a newborn oh, probably yeah. doesn't because... Yeah. They haven't become invested. They don't. They haven't developed these interests in projects and relationships and goals that give you know to go back to meaning that give our life meaning. Yeah. And um, so, although I I totally agree that you know early all other things equal an early death is worse for us than a late death because we are deprived of more. Um, a super early death might be better in some ways mm, than a yeah, yeah. slightly later death. <laughs> Maybe it's a, a an upside down I mean, U U curve or something like that. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I'm 66. And if you said, well, Shermer, your kid, I have two children, one's uh, 29, the other one's four and a half. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the four and a half has more to lose than my 29 year old daughter. But on the other hand, if you say, well, Shermer, you don't have much to lose. Look how much you've, you, uh, life you've had. I, I, I don't feel like, oh, that's that's cool. Yeah, then I don't care about dying. Or I care less about dying than my daughter who cares less. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really cash out that way because you're just thinking from this moment on, I got a bunch of stuff I want to do. And, uh, right. and we should probably note that this all this stuff applies to people that want to live. We can deal with the subject of suicide in a minute if you want. Obviously, there's people that don't want to live for 
Uh, well, you do address that a little bit with suffering. Um, you know, at some point it gets bad enough for some people, it's just better to end it, uh, at least they, they think at that moment. Yeah, I certainly find that that compelling. Although I would also add a qualifier in there, which is, you know, sometimes people think it's better that their life end and they're they're incorrect, right? They need to work right. through or they, right. they would I, need is a strong way to put it. That their life, they could possibly have a good life if they can work through whatever the obstacles are there. Um, in a way that, say, a terminally ill patient with a couple weeks to live doesn't have that same um, set of options. And yeah, an earlier death might be better there than waiting just to suffer. I mean, I'm certainly sympathetic with that that position. Yeah, yeah that's a, uh, Jesse Baring in his book on suicide talks about there's like a database of people that attempted suicide but failed. And most of them were grateful that they failed. It's like, I don't know what came over me. I was just, you know, having the worst day of my life or severely depressed. So that's a good argument for having a suicide hotline and talking people out of it uh, and getting them to counseling or therapy or some kind of medication or psychiatric help or whatever. Yeah, and absolutely. And, um, you know, this is why I, I think, you know, we benefit if we pivot away from what we care about. I mean, after all, back to the newborn babies, they presumably have no cares of continuing their life because they don't know what, they have no conceptual right. apparatus to right. conceive of that, but they have a valuable future in front of them that that presumably we want to preserve. Um, and so thinking about value, you know, what, what is genuinely good for us, um, I think can sometimes get different results than what we happen to care about um, at any given moment, given that we're subject to all these, you know, biases and, and cognitive foibles. You philosophers like to have these thought experiments where you, you, you drill down to the most extreme version to see uh, how, how the uh, underlying philosophy play, plays out. So does somebody make an argument that it's better just to not bring new life into the world at all? Because they're going to suffer. Yeah, David Benatar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Got, yeah. David Benatar has a book called Better. Oh, man, I hope I get this right. Better to never have been or better to have never been. Right. About how uh, it's better to uh, now that we exist, he doesn't think we should end our existence, um, but in the in that we have a reason to not create new people because, um, you know, in, I'm, I'm oversimplifying drastically here, but that we're we're creating um, an opportunity for suffering. And in doing that, we're doing something we're making a mistake. Um, but I, I have not been convinced by he's got some great arguments. I, I haven't been fully convinced, though. Yeah. Uh, you could make a, a sort of utilitarian argument about reducing the overall suffering in the world. His argument is about that we wrong the people. Um, there's, we're doing something wrong to the people in creating them because we are um, setting them up for suffering. And we're also setting them up for positive experiences, of course, but he thinks there's this asymmetry there between the two where it's, it's sort of wrong to not... Um, it's wrong to create somebody who will suffer. This is an oversimplification. It's wrong to create an opportunity for suffering, but it's not like required to create an opportunity for for benefiting for some new creature, new person. And so, because of that asymmetry, that that sort of, you know, I think that's that's sort of where the uh, hinge of his argument is. I was going to ask. So you you knew him obviously, and um, the way you talk about his reflections on death right at the end of his life. Uh, in Heavens on Earth, that, that's a really, I, I, I don't know, I thought, I mean, he's obviously a very smart, powerful thinker, um, but I really like the sobriety he brought to that, those thoughts of just like, this, yeah. this is what it is. And, Such a great writer and, and a thoughtful uh, uh, thinker on these things. Like he said, uh, so what death is like for him is like like you're at the party and, and you're tapped on the shoulder and said, you have to leave the party. But I don't want to leave the party, man, but it's, I know, too bad. And guess what? The party's going to go on without you, and people are going to just continue having fun. What? <laughs> but I want to stay. Yeah. And then the worst scenario is you get tapped on the shoulder and say, you can never leave the party. <laughs> so this gets to that. You know, do you really want to leave, live forever? The party's fun because it has a terminus to it, right? It's a short evening, couple hours. I better make the most of it, something like that. Oh, again, with, uh, you know, with I, I kind of started over and, and, and had a kid uh, a second time. And, and then I was thinking when I was reading your book, how many times would I want to do this? I, I think two times is enough, but would I want to do it like 25 times? You know, I just get remarried every 20, 30 years and have another kid and start over. And this goes on for centuries. Somehow it feels like it would lose its, I don't know, its newness or spontaneity or something. 
Yeah. Um, so Fisher, the guy, John Martin Fisher, who I mentioned earlier, has this, you know, this idea of repeatability that some things are sort of infinitely repeatable, maybe not infinitely, but are, are repeatable far, far out into the future. And other things aren't. Um, so we both ride bikes, for example, right? And you can you can ride a bike and then go on another bike the next day, bike ride the next <laughs> day, true, and it's right? just the wheels turn in right. day after right. day. Right. That's a highly repeatable endeavor, whereas um, other things aren't. And, you know, it's interesting, even amongst my, you know, in my little world, uh, my professional world, where people talk about, you know, what their next project is and that kind of stuff, you get people who are like, oh, I've, I've already written this kind of thing. I want, I need to do something different. I need a new project and it's not repeatable. And I, I think you're, I don't know about raising kids. Maybe you need a break, you know, take a century or two off and <laughs> yeah. then get back to reproducing later. Yeah. That I... assumes, by the way, we have the resources to carry. I think I'm people. a curious enough person. I, I wouldn't mind having dozens of careers because it seems like it's always interesting to dive into some new field or topic or trying different things. And maybe that's in that different category of repeatability. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So variation is another, right? You got to keep it varied in some way. I'm the same way as you. My problem was never what career should I go into? I mean, because I didn't find anything interesting. It was always, there's too many options out there that are all great. And I don't know how to yeah. how to choose. Um, thankfully, I chose. Maybe, well, maybe more uniqueness what might be like a concert. Uh, I, I've done several of these where I've gone to see a, a, a performer and it was just great, just fantastic. I just couldn't believe how great it was. And I went the second time. It's like, hmm, maybe I would have been better just the one time. Like I, 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 the first time yeah. I saw David Copperfield perform at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium, it was it was incredible. And then we came back the next day and it was the exact same show, even the same volunteers. And I thought, oh, I I really ah. I wish I ah. didn't know that. That the whole thing is so canned, and it's like it was better not knowing how canned it is that it felt spontaneous. Anyway, so maybe that was what yeah. is one of those non-repeatable. <laughs> it sounds like it for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so I, you know, back to back to. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go no, no, ahead. no, no. You go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say to to the question of you know if it, if life were really immortal, I think at first. You know, we do need to take seriously the idea that Im immortal life could be brutal um, just by the tedium of it. I mean, you cite uh, Borges, uh, who has this great short story, The Immortal, right? And then there's others who who have really brought it out in fiction. And it's it's terrifying when you look at it the way they they paint the picture. Um, we need we need some brilliant fiction writer to write a story about, uh, you know, a billion year old person who's just having the time of their life. <laughs> To right. make it uh, more vivid for us, I think. But I do think that that there is at least enough possibility for immortality to be perpetually good for us. That um, saying that oh well, death is good for us because immortality would be bad, isn't a source of comfort. Isn't the solace that I was looking for when I was trying to to hopefully talk to my mom about this. Thing. Yeah. So I presume you you are an atheist or a non-believer. You don't think there's an afterlife, or you don't know. Or how do you think about that? So yeah, I am. I'm not a believer. I, most days I'm agnostic, except for the days when I'm atheistic. I would say. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, my you know my mom. I was raised to to believe in God, and uh, my mom she sort of faltered towards you know, as, as she maybe got into her middle age years and beyond. But I never really asked her at the end, you know, like, do you believe in God? Do you think you're going to have an afterlife? We never had that kind of conversation. Um, so for me, this perspective was totally within, uh, sorry, th this this project was totally from within my perspective. And yeah, that that was a atheistic and agnostic perspective. Although the, the nice thing about that perspective is all of the values that I'm drawing on, everybody can 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 latch on to whether you're religious or not it doesn't matter what your religion is um everybody can find those values it's a more ecumenical approach than a specifically religious one which would rule out you know a lot of people yeah i want to get to those values but first like if your mom was a say a christian and she says i, I think i'm going to heaven do, do do you think i am i mean what what do you say if you think no i don't think there's a heaven <laughs> you can't say <Yeah>. that <laughs> i mean this is 
Michael, without knowing it, you just stumbled onto one of the great questions of my relationship with my my mom, which is, or with any loved ones, right? Which is, how honest can you be, and when can you be honest? Um, and I don't know. I t- I tend. I think when if my mom, just knowing who she was, if she was asked that question, she would want an answer. If she didn't want the the true answer from me, she just wouldn't ask. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't volunteer it without her asking at that point of her life. Yeah. So I would I would have been I would have been straightforward and said I don't I don't think so. You know I don't. There's, I mean, you go through these arguments brilliantly. That there's just not a lot of good evidence, and there's compelling reason to think that there's not any such thing. But for us. see, I so, don't think I I wouldn't lay all that out to somebody who's lying there dying, who thinks they're going somewhere. I, I'm just gonna not. I don't. Uh, to me, that, that would just be a, 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 being a dick about it. And you know, why do that? Yeah. I mean, if they ask, yeah. you know, I'm intellectually curious to know what you think. Okay, I'll tell you intellectually. But uh, a lot of those conversations, like you're having. Those aren't intellectual, you know, just eggheads talking about the big questions in life. Uh, did you ever see the movie, uh, um, The uh, Invention of Lying, Ricky Gervais's film? Uh, if I have, I don't remember. Okay, let, let, so let, let me reconstruct it for you because it is this great moment. So he lives in this world where uh, everybody always tells the truth 100%. Uh, and And so life is just kind of going along and... And uh, and there's funny moments where people are blurting out exactly what they're thinking. And and uh, anyway, so then one day he goes to the bank to withdraw eight hundred dollars and he sees I like to withdraw eight hundred dollars. And the teller says, well, you only have it says here you only have six hundred dollars. But that must be wrong because you said you have eight hundred. So here's your eight hundred. And he's like, oh, my God. (laughs) And he walks out the door of the bank like I just figured out what I can do. So, of course, this is a guy movie, right? So he walks down the sidewalk, and here's this attractive woman. And he says, we have to have sex right now or the world's going to end. And she says, do we have time to get a hotel room, or do we have to do it right here? <laughs> so the, the movie kind of unfolds along that kind of humor. But then his right. mother is dying. So his mother says to him, what happens to me? And he thinks nothing. So he then says, well, when you die, everybody gets their own mansion." And you get, you know, the finest clothes and all the food and servants. And it's just going to be great. This big mansion in the sky. And and the nurses overhear this. And they're still living in the world where everybody always tells the truth. And they're like, oh, my God, did you hear? You hear what happens when we die? We all get a mansion. Anyway, so by the time, uh, you know, a, a few more scenes roll out, he's at home. And he's got this throng of people like, we want to know more about what happens after we die. And he he comes out with these two pizza boxes because he had pizza delivered. So he looks like Moses with the tablets, right, where he's written down <laughs> some rules for them because he's now realized I'm a guru. <laughs> and it's all done very lightly and, and, and quite funny. But that moment of like, what do you say to your mom when she says, you know, what's going to happen? Do you just make up something because it makes them feel better? Obviously, you would you would argue that would not be a justified line. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to lie. I might, I, I mean, like you said, you don't want to be a jerk about it. I'm sure if, if it seemed like a sensitive moment, I would just say, I don't know, you know, and play and I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I would handle it. It'd be a tough moment. But yeah, um, but yeah, I, I think sometimes people want that honesty too. They want the hard conversation and they're ready, especially towards the end. Some people, not all people, but some people are ready to finally confront those questions that they have kind of been putting off or avoiding for some emotional reason, maybe. Um, so I think there can be a time for it. Yeah, the way I, I, I think about it is whether you're a Christian or an atheist or whatever, whether there's an afterlife or not is kind of irrelevant because we live in this life. It's it, We live in the here and now, not the hereafter. So that's the core of your book. So let's get into that. Like, How do you find gratitude well, you're you're using the word solace. You, you kind of walk us through how you get from gratitude to solace, which I guess is more of a sort of a, a comfortable agreement with or finding solace in the process or something like that. Uh, but but you start with this great analogy of the, you know, the 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 teenager gets a car, and it's their first car, and they're happy to have a car, but oh, it's got an eight track player, and I don't like that. You know, in other words, life is like a car; it's going to have some good parts and, and bad parts. So how do you build uh, gratitude from there? Yeah, so the story of the teenager with the 8-track is important for me because of how she, so she gets this in the story, the version of the story I tell, she gets this car from her parents and, um, 
you know, the parents had to really sacrifice to get it for her. They had to, you know, work extra hours and didn't get nice things for themselves and said, save, saved up to get their kid this car. And it has some, some defects like an eight track instead of something she can stream um, to. <laughs> and, uh, and the, the, what I, one of the lessons I think we can draw from that situation is not just that the teenager should be grateful regardless of the fact that it's, you know, an imperfect car, but that she should even be grateful for that from stereo. Like there's a, there's, there's a way in which we need to appreciate the whole car. And if the teenager starts picking and choosing, well, I like this bit, but not that bit, that's not gratitude or it's not maybe the right kind of gratitude. And um, so I call this holistic gratitude where you're gra grateful for the whole thing. And then if you add in a, a belief that, well, to be grateful for something, even that crummy stereo, it's got to have some goodness in it. The question is, well, where would it get the goodness, right? If, it's, right? if it's if it doesn't work for her at all, what's so good about the stereo? And the answer for me is, well, just it's good just by virtue of being a part of this of this important gift that she gets. And so, the idea then is that um, value or goodness can radiate from the whole to each of its parts, and then our attitudes uh, are uh, they follow accordingly. So. She she recognizes that there's something good about the whole car and is grateful, therefore, for the whole car. And so I, as you know, go on to tell a story about how that can um, take a lot of different forms for a lot of different objects or even people in our lives, the people we love. I think we often have holistic love for or holistic appreciation or gratitude for. That is to say, we love them as whole objects and so we love even their flaws. But if those flaws get really bad, if the car spontaneously combusts, <laughs> or if you're, you know, the love of your life turns into a homicidal maniac or something, those are moments where whatever gratitude you had gets canceled because it's, the good qualities are being just totally drowned out by the bad qualities. And so either you just get rid of gratitude there, or you take a different kind of attitude where you are acknowledging the bad, but also still acknowledging the good. And that's why I think solace is. I think of solace or comfort as finding you know, appreciation of positive value when there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Nobody needs comfort when they're having a great day, right? You need comfort when you're having a bad day. And um, so comfort or solace only um, is an attitude that makes sense in a sea of badness. And that's, I think, the appropriate form, um, uh, the appropriate attitude, or at least one appropriate attitude to have towards death. Um, but that might've gone a little bit, I skipped over some important bits. Oh, no, no, that's, that's, that's really great. Um... You had that uh, great scene from um, Oh Goodwill Hunting. I wanted to read that that little passage because yeah. uh, it's it's it, I, I love that movie and Robin Williams is just so good uh, at what he's talking about his wife and he says he, so he's he's telling um, uh, his his charge that he's helping. My wife had all sorts of wonderful idiosyncrasies. You know what? She used to fart in her sleep. Sorry, I shared that with you. One night it was so loud, I woke up the dog. She woke up and like, is that you? And I said, yeah. I didn't have the heart to tell her. She's been dead two years, and that's the shit I remember. Wonderful stuff. You know, little things like that. Uh, but those are the things I miss the most, the little idiosyncrasies that only I know about. That's what made her my wife. Oh, and she had the, good, she had the goods on me, too. She knew all of my little peccadilloes. People call these imperfections, but they're not. Ah, that's the good stuff. And then we get to choose who we let into our weird little world. You're not perfect, sport. And let me tell you, uh, save you the suspense, the girl you met, she isn't perfect either. But the question is whether or not you're perfect for each other. That's the whole deal. That's what intimacy is all about. It's such a great moment. Mm -hmm. And that, that, I mean, that's a, if, you've, if you're a fan of the movie, you, you remember that scene, right? It's a powerful yeah. bit of acting. and um, Yeah. And that's, you know, so that's what I'm interested in is this idea that we could recognize something as an imperfection and yet still find value in it and not in value elsewhere. Not like, oh, yeah, my wife does this, but I love these other things about her. It's that this thing she does that is an imperfection, is a peccadillo, is still the good stuff. It's still something we, we actually end up liking. The example I use about my life is my wife having a really terrible sense of direction. I mean, it's just awful. It's always and it's it's reliably incorrect. <laughs> and uh, as much as as much as that has frustrated me over the years when we've taken a wrong turn, it's at, after a little while it became this really endearing quality where I, I'd smile and chuckle every time she'd say we should go left when I knew we needed to go right. Um, and and that to me is is um, 
is is sort of the the key to understanding. I think finding solace in death is that um, if we can latch on to some goodness among a sea of badness, um, then that's enough to take some comfort or to find some appreciation or gratitude. It depends on the case. But some sort of positive attitude, even when there's a negative attitude alongside it. Um, and so, you know, if the connection for me with death is that um, if we're supposed to be grateful for life, and I think that does make sense to say we ought to be grateful for life. And if life is one of these goods that can have a holistic appreciation, a holistic gratitude, and I think it can, um, then if death is part of that life, remember, we're talking about just that last moment, right? Right at the end. It's not when you're already non-existent. It's right. the moment where you pass away. If that right. itself is a part of life, then like the crummy eight-track stereo or, you know, your partner's foibles or, or yeah. bodily functions, whatever, we can latch onto it and find something really exciting, really endearing, really um, something to really be affirmative about, even amidst a bunch of badness. So you're, you're applying this to your own life, not you personally, but I mean – this is an argument that I should look at my whole life. It's got all these bad things and good things and a balance. And I should just be grateful for the whole thing. But 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 can I be unhappy about this one little thing over here I don't like, or 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 try to change that other thing I don't like? Yeah. And you know, to what extent does that does become too much of an obsession, and you're forgetting the big picture? Right. I think that's a really important question. One of the um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that although we should be grateful for life, like and by that, I mean a human life, like a conscious existence. So I don't mean um, like just biological life in the sense that any biological creature is alive. I mean, this conscious um, where you have some some agency, uh, maybe some autonomy. And that kind of life, I think, is something to be grateful for. But I don't think that we should therefore be grateful for everything we experience. Right. So if you had, you know. You like you had a, bi a bicycling accident and uh, that experience, maybe there was some value in it, but it would make sense to me to say, even though you love your life and you're grateful for your existence, that experience, not so, yeah. not so positive. Right. Um, and so, so I think it's important to separate out what it means to have a life and then to have all the experiences in our life. Those are yeah. two different things on, on the way I see it. But on the other hand, because you also make this argument about history and the sort of contingent nature of history, and if you tweak one thing back here, it's going to be different now than it was. Either way, good or bad, it could go either way. So like the bike accident, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not happy I crashed, but on the other hand, I was having neck problems anyway. Turns out my uh, two of my vertebrae were severely um, arthritic, and it, I was in a lot of pain anyway, and this launched me to... Uh, the ER, so they took these pictures, and then my doc was, oh, my God, we got to do a fusion here. Boom, boom. I got 100% neck now. Well, not 100%, but <laughs> for a 66-year-old guy, it's pretty good, right? But I'm out of pain. So I could then say, well, that bad thing led to this good thing. And you really could do that for everything, right? Uh, oh, I know what I was going to say, that um, it's one thing to make that argument. I think most people are not good at rem – they need reminders of that every day uh, because of the negativity bias, for example, and how we notice bad yeah. things more than good things and so on. This is why self-help gurus are always, uh, you know, hawking their tapes and their little uh, uh, posters and, 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 and reminders and, and just, you know, every little daily reminders, you know, because it's easy to kind of slip into that and think my life just sucks, even though mm -hmm. you have this, you know, by most standards, a great life. And uh, so it's almost like we're not really well programmed to, to do what you're suggesting we need to do. Yeah, and as as you point out in, in in your book, right, that that's a there's some evolutionary advantage to that, or there was back yeah. in our ancestral times, uh, but right now it's not it's not freaking out and being negative all the time isn't always helpful um, for sure. Although to go back to what you said about about the bike accident leading to this good result where you uh, ended up being able to treat pre existing pain and get get rid of that, I definitely think that bad stuff in our life can be instrumentally good. It can lead to good things. And one of the cases I discussed in the book is um, the Dalai Lama saying oh, that yeah. although you know, he didn't like being exiled, he, he was uh, from Tibet, he was grateful for the opportunity it gave him to work on his patients and see the world. And, and he, he, I guess, was living a cloistered life until that point and then finally got out into the world and it was a good thing for him. But I don't, I mean, my own view, some people want to say, well, look, you can't get 
the good result without that bad origin. My own view is that when you're talking about that cause and effect, that instrumental kind of goodness, where this bad thing leads to something good, that um, while maybe there's a, a sense in which we need to be appreciative of the entire package, there's another piece of us that says, yeah, but if I could have gotten my neck to feel better without the bike accident, I would have preferred that, right? Like that'd be a better way to go. Whereas other things, so if you take again, um, Robin Williams' character in, in Good Will Hunting, if you said, well, you could have your wife minus this pe the peccadillos, he would say, no, 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 <laughs> that takes away the good stuff, right? That's that's so that's a different kind of valuation, I think. So there's the instrumental valuation, and then there's the idea that just because she's his wife, she has, you know, her her flaws take on a different meaning to him and a different meaning to to um, their relationship. I guess this is why and I think death death can. I think this this must be why uh, like marriage counselors or just psychologists think, uh, you know, people should date for like two years before they get married because, it uh, you know, the dating process is figuring out how many of these little picadellos you, you're willing to put up with or that you think are cute or whatever. Because if there's too many, then you're like, you know what? No, nah, I'm just not vibing this person. It's not going to work out. And then you move on to the next person. And that takes a while. The, the wrong one, the one that triggers you. Yes. Can be tough, right? Yeah, so it's like my podcast guest this week is um, uh, Kevin um, uh, Kevin Dutton. His book is Black and White Thinking. So he has this problem of the problem of the heap. How many grains of sand does it take to make a heap? Well, you know, one grain, no. So if I put a second grain next to the first grain, is that a heap? No. You know, okay, how about nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine grains? Is the one more make a heap? We've already established that one more doesn't make a heap. Anyway, but at some point, subjectively, you go, "Yep, that's now a heap." Okay. So you're you're right. dating different people and you're like no 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 and but this this package the the quantitative characteristics that you like at some point add up you go that's the one and I'm not sure we we know what that is <laughs> like the heat problem I don't know I just know like that's too many or that's not enough or that's just right whatever you're talking about yeah I think I think there well I think. There's two things. One is we don't know. We can't. And each package is different. I mean, each trade off with each person is going to have its own own challenges and own rewards. But the other thing is, is that, of course, we change. Right. So you can date for two years. But after 20 years, that'll look different. Yeah. After right. 40 years, yes. it'll look different. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. 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 Or, you know, you, you talk like a lot of soldiers will talk about the best time in their entire life was when they were in this battle field with their buddies. A and OK, I get that. Uh, but would you want to do that for 20 years instead of the two years you served or something like that? Because at some point, it's not going to be a fulfilling experience. Right. Although some don't, I mean, some soldiers seem to, you know, re-enlist or whatever. That's um, true. Yeah. Yeah, that's because right. Because of that. Yeah. Right? yeah. They need that camaraderie or whatever, or just having the life on the line with other people maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's another great example of how we find, you know, like, it's, it's, it's not instrumentally going to lead to something good, but just it itself is something good, even though it's something bad to be in a right. war zone, yeah. um, both to be under lethal threat and to pose a lethal threat to others. But at the same time, you've got um, this, this thing that's a piece of it. And, and I think we need a more complicated um, way of talking about the pros and cons there. Um, and that complicated way is to say, you know, like what Robin Williams says um, in, in that, which is, the bad things themselves are the good things, and we need to figure out how to, how to unpack that. One of my favorite authors in this genre is uh, Jocko Willink. Do you know Jocko Willink? He's the former Navy no, SEAL. He's a former Navy SEAL. Uh, Extreme Ownership is his first book, and the second book was Discipline Equals Freedom. Anyway, he's got this whole tape. So if you, if you Google Jocko Willink, W-I-L-L-I-N-K, comma, good. You'll see this like three minute video where he has this thing where he would tell his, his soldiers under him, you know, they would come to him and complain, you know, hey, I didn't get the gear I wanted. Good. We'll, we're going to try some different gear. Well, I, I, I wanted to get that promotion and I didn't get it. Good. You can learn to do something better now. And he just kind of grinds through these different characters. You, know, you, did, you didn't get to date the person you wanted. Good. You can find somebody even better than her. Or this is what I tell my students, you know, you didn't get into the college you wanted. Good. You got into this college. Better for you because you met me, you know, and on and on. Yeah. But 
I think people, including myself, uh, have to be reminded of this constantly. When I'm going throughout my day and something happened, I'm just like, oh, God darn it. It's like, no, 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 no. Channel your inner Jocko Wilnick and say, good, good, lucky me that this bad thing happened, <laughs> right? It doesn't come naturally. Yeah. It, that's so interesting because I've had the same experience. And then I don't know what happened, but a couple of years ago, it became easier for me. I mean, whereas I would say most of my life, I was, I thought about, you know, I had the same experience that you just described. Maybe, you know, what it might have been is just I immersed myself in this literature on gratitude and you read around and there's, unsurprisingly, most gratitude researchers are really pro gratitude. And um, it starts to really sink in how much benefit there can be to taking that stance of finding your gratitude, finding the good amidst the bad, um, and, and what a benefit it can mean for your physical health. Not, let alone your mental health, but uh, physical health, it can affect your wallet. It can affect, you know, like a number of things it looks like, at least that's what the early results are, are indicating about the value of gratitude. And um, I think that made a big impression on me because you're right. We go around life on autopilot or worse kind of mired in our own frustrations and grievances and resentments. And, and, you know, that stuff can be a, can be a like quicksand and suck you in. And it's important to try to find a way out of it. And better yet, like you're saying, prevent it in the first place by keeping that kind of daily practice of focusing on what's good. Supposedly that's what meditation is supposed to be good for. I, I've just never been able to get into it because I haven't committed the time, I guess, and to, to really get into it. But I'll give you a self-deprecating example of this. The other day I was out on a bike ride with, with one of my friends and uh, I was complaining that the door handle on my Tesla broke and I have to climb in through the other side to open the door. And I'm going on and on about this. He goes, Shermer, are you seriously complaining about your life? You're driving a Tesla. We're riding bikes in Santa Barbara. It's 80 degrees in January. I go, yeah, you're right. Never mind. <laughs> it's all in perspective. Door handle. <laughs> yeah, and the door handle. Yeah. Well, so, okay, you, you yeah. philosophers like, again, these thought experiments you like to run. What if we rolled back the clock and 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 killed Hitler, and therefore no Hitler, no Holocaust, no World War II. Everything would have been different. This the world would have been a better place, less suffering, no nuclear weapons, no six million Jews dead, and on and on. But as you point out, well, then that means this person wouldn't have met that person at this camp or shortly after, and then they wouldn't have had these children who would never would have been born. So, how do you think about uh, history? I would not. Gratitude. I would not exist if not for World War II. I'm pretty sure about that. Um, and it's not just World War II. It's the global slave trade. It's all the awful stuff in our history, our past as a species, that if not for those things, other people would have been created than the people who are here now, right? If, if you send us off on a different um, course, historical course, then, then, then um, different people result. And so this does raise the question of, well, gosh, if I'm grateful for my existence, and I'm grateful for all that entails. Am I grateful, therefore, for these terrible, terrible things that I don't want to affirm at all? And part of me thinks, oh, well, sure, I would give up my life so that, you know, Hitler didn't have his his reign of terror. Um, but when you think about it from the perspective of a parent, I have a I have a 10 year old daughter and. You know, it's really impossible, I would say, as a loving parent, it is or near impossible to say, oh, yeah, I would give up my child's life for changing history. Like giving up my own life doesn't bother me nearly as much as the idea that this person I, I have, um, I you know, it's just a different kind of love than self-love, I guess. Um, and and that that dominates our way of thinking. And so there's this real puzzle about, well, you know, would we, if you could do it all over again, would you have history unspooled the way that it did with all its terrible stuff? Or would you change it, but then get and have much better stuff, but then get rid of all the people you love? Get rid of all the people, by the way, who were also all the victims of the Holocaust. They would never would have existed either. Right. And in fact, right. human beings might not have existed. If you could, you know, call a god down and say, create a, the gentlest species you can, it would not be us, right? It would be a different species. Um, and so uh, I think there's an argument to be made that, yeah, 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 right, um, that we should, you know, affirm this history. There's a lot of pressure to affirm the history because we, we, we want who we are and our loved ones and so on. But on the other hand, it's just an awful history. Um, I come down, I mean, there's pessimists who say, yeah, it's all terrible. And there's optimists who say, no, this is the best way things could be. My own view is that neither answer is is adequate and that there is no real resolution. Not, not that it's hard to find, but that there's actually no um, stable 
uh, answer as to, you know, if you could do it all over again, if you could rewind history and press play again, would you do it? Um, there's no definitive answer to that. And um, so I, I call for what I call an, a, a conceivable impossibility is what we want, right? I want my grandparents to have met in a much nicer universe than this one, um, which I can conceive of, but but as a matter of, of natural law is, is impossible, right? Um, and that's the best we can do, I think. I mean, these are really tricky questions. Back to your bike accident, would you, you know, unspool the bike accident and therefore your your neck um, the, the solution to your pre-existing neck pain, or, or would you go through all that if you had the chance to do it over again? Yeah. Um, well, obviously I think I, I would have preferred to just have the surgery without the accident, but I didn't really get pushed into it. So again, it's kind of radical contingency in history. Things just unfolded the way they did. I mean, I was almost about to go to a chiropractor, which my doc said that would have been catastrophic because the nerve, the openings that the nerves came through were so small and, and it was all compressed in there causing the pain that an adjustment might have done some serious damage. I thought, oh, lucky I got in that bike accident. That, you know, that would be an example of, of a contingent turning point there in history. Yeah. Another, another one of my favorite movies in this genre is It's a Wonderful Life. You, you must know the, uh, you know, the uh, Jimmy Stewart film, uh, which I was really introduced to for the meaning of it by Stephen Jay Gould, who, who was one of my mentors and then a friend because he kind of pushed this uh, uh, this kind of radical contingency of history. So rewinding the tape like you just did, but go back to the dinosaurs and there's no meteor impact. Mammals would have never taken off like they did. You know, they'd be we wouldn't be here, not just us, but no primates or no hominids at all. And then that's, so that's radical. So then you can really get crazy. Well, well, if the multiverse is true, then it's lucky we had the Big Bang. <laughs> Because it would have banged in some other universe yeah. and be some other laws of nature, you know. So you know, I, it's it's kind of fun to think about. But at yeah. some some point, it's like, yeah, but this is the world we got. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the, and within this world, we have, um, you know, what? So then it becomes a question of within our world, what what attitude do we take towards it? Right? What attitude do you take towards your bike accident, or or does um, Robin Williams' character take towards his wife, or do we take towards death? Um, I mean, that's and that's where making room for some extra kind of extra dimensions of value, maybe is I'm not sure if I like that way of putting it, but um, where where goodness can come in just by being part of uh, sorry, a thing can have goodness to it just by being a part of something else um, that's good. I think that that promises um, to make sense of a lot of attitudes we want to hold on to, um, including the kind of mixed attitude you have towards. You know your bike, the bike accident, and discovering you you put, you know you went the right path rather than the wrong path with surgery versus chiropractic treatment, and so forth. Yeah, that the movie uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" makes this point I think poignantly. So recall Jimmy Stewart's character um, uh, ends up staying home while his brother goes off to fight in the war, so he kind of misses out on being a hero like that. But he sort of takes care of stuff at home, becomes a, a banker, uh, and then a series of bad things happen in, in which the you know the evil. Uh, banker in the town kind of uh, overruns him, and then one of his employees or his uncle, I guess, loses eight thousand dollars, which was you know in 1940, whatever that was, it was a huge amount of money. And this goes on and on, where he gets to the point like I I don't want to live anymore, and he goes to that bridge. <laughs> it's in December, it's Christmas time, and he's about to throw himself off the bridge when uh, Clarence, the guardian angel in charge of him. <laughs> steps down and falls into the river and jumps into the river ahead of him. So Jimmy Stewart jumps in to save him. And then this conversation ensues where he says, I just don't want to live anymore. And so the angel says, okay, let's, let's look at the world, what it would look like without you in it. So then they replay this thing. And it's, it's like back to the future part two, where it's all dark and grim and things are bad. And, uh, you know, and then, so then the guardian angel says, you see, George, you've been given a, a gift, a chance to see what the world would be like without you. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives, and when he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? And, of course, then the movie ends on in a happy ending there where he's so grateful to see his kids and wife, who he was just, just before super irritated with because they were screaming at him and demanding and all this stuff. Now he's just, I, please scream at me. Be demanding. <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, so. 
you know, that, I mean, that way of looking at it almost suggests that we should be grateful for everything in our lives, even the really bad, you know, being bullied as a kid or something like yeah, that, um, yeah. just because it's a part of life. Like I was saying earlier, I'm not, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to that idea, but I'm not sold on it either because it sure seems like some of those irritations didn't have to be part of the wonderful life. It yeah. could have been more wonderful without it. <laughs> yeah, even, well, and that's why we work to make up uh, the world a better place. So there. So you still have a, a, an eventful uh, life, but it's a better eventful life, or, or the challenges are, 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 are different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, the idea that, and this is another way in which gratitude can, can really be both helpful and an appropriate response, is that, you know, when we're thinking about making things better, that's something our gratitude can latch on to. And um, even that, even again, amidst a sea of badness, to find that 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 morsel of goodness can can attract enough of a positive attitude that it gives us comfort. It, it gives us it's got enough goodness to it that it, it gives us a more you know, for lack of a better word, a, a happier a happier life, a happier place in this world. Yeah, and reading that section of your book, I was also reminded of Dan Lieberman's new book. I just had him on the podcast. His book is called uh, Exercised. So he's an anthropologist at Harvard who studies. Uh, indigenous peoples around the world, and and so he got interested in to what extent they exercise. So you know he's telling these people he's working with uh, about these like triathletes. They pay thousands of dollars to go run for you know, hours and hours and swim, and and these people are looking at him like people pay to do that. Why? Or you know he brings a treadmill and it's like, would you run on the treadmill? Why would I run on a treadmill that goes nowhere? I spend most of my life. Working, lifting, carrying, walking, you know, and so in, in a strange way, it's like in the modern world, we've solved all these problems to make life easier and more comfortable, but then it's boring, right? So then we pay money to go to Everest or, you know, to triathlons or whatever, just to yeah. make it interesting. So there, in terms of your gratitude, what must be built into it is some kind of meaningful activity that challenges you, pushes you. Not just to have a comfort, yeah. soft life, but a, a hard, challenging life. Maybe so. I mean, this is where, so this, right, this, as I'm sure you know, this was Schopenhauer's big complaint about life, right, is that either you don't have what you want, and then you're frustrated, or you get it, and then you're bored. So <laughs> either way, you lose. And um, I think right. that what you just right. said um, is, a big, is a big part of the solution, which is, um, the activities themselves that, that matter. And, so, and, you know, as you know, psychologists have really emphasized finding value in the activity rather than in the end goal or something like that. And um, here in Setia, the philosopher um, has, has this thing on midlife crises where he, he argues that that's exactly the solution to a certain kind of midlife crisis is to, is to immerse ourselves in valuable activities rather than, you know, checking off a list of accomplishments, you know, to, to go from K2 to Everest, Eventually, it's it's the what next problem. It's the it's the the person who gets their Olympic gold medal at, at 20, 20, 22. and then um, if that was really the only thing that provided meaning to them, that's that's a real problem. We want to find things that are valuable not for the goal but for the um, the activity itself. Oh, I saw a great example of this the other night on the the new Tiger Woods documentary. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's streaming on HBO. Not yet. No. Oh, it's an incredible story. So you know he's groomed from age of two by his dad to be, you know, the world's greatest golfer. And that's what he becomes. At 21, he's got a $100 million contract from Nike. You know, he is the most famous golfer in the world. And his dad, turns out, was a um, a Green Beret, a Special Forces guy, a real badass in Vietnam. and served multiple uh, uh, services there and so on, uh, tours there. And uh, so he really, really drove Tiger just to, to be this just, just hard-ass, tough-minded, focused and he did. That's what he became. All right. So then fast forward, uh, you know, 14 majors later, and, you know, he's worth a gazillion dollars, private jets, on and on and on. And and I remember when this happened in 2010, he won the, the uh, PGA Open in uh, uh, at Torrey Pines down by San Diego. And he was limping, and they were talking about uh, Tiger broke his leg. And it's like, how does a golfer break his leg? What the fuck? And in the documentary, they show what happened, that he got bored with golf, and he went and joined the um, Navy SEAL training camp. It's like, what? And he goes out to the desert where they have this whole yeah. camp set up, and they, they just beat the crap out of you. And so he was just pounded on, and but he couldn't get enough of it. He's like, this is what I want. Oh, this is so cool. And they actually have video of him 
you know, there's Tiger Wood. You're used to seeing him with the Nike, you know, hat on. And, so, and he's got like the whole, uh, you know, Navy SEAL outfit and he's got the gun and, and people are pounding on him and he's pounding on them. And they showed how mo- these guys get injured, serious, bad injuries. And that's what happened to him. He got injured right. badly. And then they cut to his longtime uh, caddy, Steve, the Australian guy, who was his caddy for like 15 years. And he's, this guy says, yeah, Tiger came to me and said, you know, Steve, I'm thinking about quitting golf and becoming a Navy SEAL. And he's like, what? Are you out of your mind? You have the best life ever. <laughs> and you want to go off to some foreign country where you're probably going to get killed or seriously injured? You won't make any much money? No one will even know who you are? What? <laughs> so there, there must have been something in his mind, like, I've, I've accomplished all this. What else is there to do other than get to Jack Nicholson's 18 majors? Uh, my dad was a special forces guy. He loved his dad. His dad had died. Maybe he wants to connect to him some way. You know, they don't, he didn't participate right. in the documentary, so we don't know what's in his head, but maybe something like that. Right. Well, interestingly, if, if that was, you know, what that was ultimately about was reconnecting with his dad in some way, that does become a focus on the activity, or in this case, maybe the relationship, as opposed to a goal, as opposed mm. to, you know, your first major or your 18th major or whatever. Um, sporting goals you might have. Um, maybe, you know, maybe that was the moment where Tiger realized, boy, you know, this achieving goals is nice, but as Schopenhauer pointed out, like, then it's over. Yeah. And you got to figure right. out what else life has to offer, no matter what the goal is. If it's something important or if it's just planting a, you know, successfully planting a tomato plant in your backyard. Yeah. Um, it seems like, it seems like we need the activity as much as we need the success. Yeah, the journey. I'm going to read a, another one of my favorite passages about this topic from Richard Dawkins in Unweaving the Rainbow. I'm sure you're familiar with this. It's now widely quoted. Richard says, We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will, in fact, never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Arabia. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively exceeds the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. Man. That is good writing. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Love it. Uh, and yeah, and that's so that's that's the essence, I think, of being grateful for life, right? Is you find the value, um, you know, I think finding value in that we were lucky to be created is is what that you know passage is focusing on. And it is incredibly like, I mean, it's preposterous how <laughs> unlikely yeah. it is that yeah. you will be created or that I will be created of all the possibilities out there. Um, but in addition to that, there's the luck of just continuing to live, right? I mean, every turn could be a car accident or a downed electrical line or right. now a virus, right? Um, I mean, where it's wherever we go, there are these ways that life could have been so much worse than it is, even once you're created. I mean, sometimes we go, oh, I wish I were immortal. I mean, I think on our deathbed or as we think about our death, this is what we're inclined to think is I wish I were immortal or I wish I could live longer and this isn't fair. But if you look at it from the perspective of, I'm sure glad I didn't die at the age of two, <laughs> yeah. um, you, know, you know, that then the and then the question becomes, OK, well, if you're really grateful for that life that you did, that you are lucky to live, then what do you you know, what do you want to be grateful for as part of that? So you might say, well, I'm grateful I got to meet my loved ones. You might say, I'm grateful that I got to see everything, you know, taste ice cream and have all these wonderful sensory experiences. Um, the, the thing that I want to draw out in, in, in the solace in the book is, is that, weirdly, one of the things we ought to be grateful for is our mortality, because death is a part of the existence that we're so lucky to get. And because that existence requires that holistic, you got to love the whole thing, just like the teenager has to love the whole car, even that crummy stereo. Um, you know, there's a, there's a way in which we have to find positive value even in death. And I think that, by the way, you know, back to your, your religious questions from earlier. I think there's something really liberating about this thought that, um, yeah, this could be, uh, you know, a lot of downside to dying, but um, there's something really liberating about going, yeah, but it's a piece of my life without which there'd be no, there would have been no me. 
and there would have been none of the wonderful things that I've, I've gotten. Right. Yeah, you write uh, something like that here. I was going to read the last paragraph of the penultimate chapter, uh, the, la- the last part. I think it's called the last part. What makes passing away an affliction is that it is the part of our fates that in one shot rips away all of our valuable opportunities. But in depriving us this way, passing away makes itself a part, the last part of the lives that it ends. That laces it with radiant value from the meaningful good that is our kind of existence. That's good writing. Nicely said. That is That does okay. make your point. All right, so what is solace, and, and what does it feel like? How do we get it? How do you make that final step? Right, so the final step, then, is that if death is a part of life, like you were just, you know, um, that, that bit you just read, and if we ought to be um, affirmative of our lives, that we, we recognize how lucky we are to have them and how good they are for us, um, once we get that stage, then if, because it's what I'm calling a meaningful good in that passage, where that means it's a part of our, our valuable narratives. It's a part of our ongoing stories that make our lives so good. The things we love and don't want to lose when we die. Because life itself is a piece of that, um, we need to embrace all of its parts. And I suggest one of those parts is passing away. And this is sort of the controversial metaphysical piece of the whole picture, but that the moment of passing away is the last thing that happens to us. It's that last part of death. And because of, uh, sorry, the last part of life, and because it's a part of life, it gets some of life's value. And so I don't think it makes sense to be grateful for death because death is so bad. You know, there's so many deprivations involved in it that gratitude is is a more full-throated, like, this is wonderful. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't feel that way. But um, I do think uh, I, I take solace and I want readers to take solace in this idea that, well, even though it, we're not grateful for death, there's still something to affirm in it. You got all the bad stuff that we want to, you know, regret in some way, but we also have one good thing in it. And that's that it's, and it doesn't matter how you die. It doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are. There's a good thing for everybody uh, in death, which is that they got to live. That's a piece of existence is the end of it. Um, Or so I are. And so that's what we can take solace. I like the way you write this. Solace is the attitude we can take toward death when, Amid all the reasons it gives us to be afraid and despondent, we attend to the radiant value that it gathers from life. When there is so much badness, we don't expect to find bliss. We don't demand unbridled joy or hope for wholehearted cheer. We just want to find some comfort. Yeah, that's good. I really like that. That's a really, it's a really good, yeah, that, important work there. Yeah. Can I ask you about something else? Yeah. I didn't I didn't uh, cue you for this in our e- email correspondence, but your other book, What is Race? So this is like when musicians change chords and it becomes a different song. <laughs> uh because we're living in, you know, now we have a new president, we're going to uh, we're going to he's going to solve the, you know, the race problem or at least he's going to address the race issue in a way different than Trump did. Whatever happens, it's still a huge issue. Right? And uh so I'm I'm curious. I, don't, I haven't even read your book. I haven't even looked at it. I, I don't know what your position is on race. Is, do you think race is real? Why is it so important in America versus other countries? My wife's from Germany, and she moved here to be with me. Which I still think it was a big mistake, but don't tell her that. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, they had their own issues over there with the Turks, and the, before that, the Jews. And so everybody has their bigotries. But when she moved here, she's like, this is all Americans seem to talk about on the daily news and shows. And race, race, race. Well, given our history. So how do you uh, think about race and what do you think is the long-term solution to this constant tension we have in America? Yeah. Um, by the way, I used to uh, live and, and teach in New Zealand. And in addition to, and all, all the writings that I taught, or most of the writings I taught were from American or Canadian authors. And um, and uh, there, all my students in New Zealand were like, what is going on up there that, Right. So, so not just think about race a lot, um, but but some strange views about race and what it is. And right. so, yeah, it's a very culturally local thing in, in that kind of sense. Um, so, I, I mean, I have very unfortunately, I have very few good ideas about how to solve our strife, our conflict. Um, but I do want to I do think that one small piece of it is figuring out what we're talking about when we talk about race. Um, and that's really what that book is about. So that book is for authors. What is race? 
um, for, I think the subtitle is Four Philosophical Views. And there's four of us who are each staking out different ground and then debating as to, you know, the merits of, so we each lay out our views in one chapter each, and then we each have a follow-up chapter where we explain why we think the other uh, co-authors are mistaken. And um, so, uh, no, I don't believe, so I have two positions that I'm comfortable with. Um, one is that race is just an illusion. So one of the other authors says race is a biological reality. Two of uh, the other two authors say it's a social, it's a, so, a real social construction in the way that, you know, being a, um, say, a college professor is something we invented, but it's still real, right? It's yeah. not yeah, yeah. an illusion the way witchcraft is an illusion. <laughs> um, so Good those are the yeah. other two authors. And um, I'm my, my, my sort of lead in view is that, okay, both of those are wrong because race just is an illusion. It's just not real. It's more like witchcraft is what I want to say. Mm. Although there's a part of me that says, well, maybe race could be real. And this came to me through an exchange with a, a former student of mine, Jonathan Woodward, so I want to give him some credit here. Um, but he he and I you know, ended up exploring this idea that um, maybe race could be real in a way that is non-scientific. And by that, I mean social sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, all of the sciences, um, that there might be a kind of reality that, that um, exceeds what science measures. Um, so if you just take random, and I'm looking around my little desk here, I've got a copy of my book and a pen. Right, so the pen and the book, all they have in common, really, well, they're both held by me, but they're also um, material objects. But that's about it. But we still might say that, well, I'm holding things that are either a pen or a book, and um, that would be true. But it's not a category science would ever pick up on. And so maybe race, because that category, a pen or a book, doesn't do anything. Right? It has no causal power in the world. Um, and uh, and so. So I want to say that, well, maybe race could be like that, where it's just a collection of people organized according to a certain similarity profile. And um, that's it. But it's not scientifically credible in any way. And by the way, if that is what sci what race is, then, um, you know, we're all members of many different races because you could organize those similarity profiles in so many different ways. So, yeah, my view is that race is either not real or if it is real, it's real in a very attenuated way. Yeah. Yeah, we did a issue. Do I have the race issue up there? Yeah, there we have the race issue of skeptics. Our author there uh, talked about populations rather than races. You know, because you know, in, 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 in medical sciences, you know, they do make distinctions between, say, blacks are more likely to get sickle cell anemia and whites are more likely to get this or depression or whatever it is. And uh, so it, it's something of a useful proxy for something else that's going on inside the skin. Um, but then the problem is the, the gray areas. These are very fuzzy sets that are super overlapping. And there it's harder to really say what you mean when you say the blacks or the African-Americans or, well, you know, people that are from West Africa are different from people that are in other parts of Africa, which are different from Haitians, which are different. So what do you mean by, forget the word black or race, you know, populations, which populations, where, where are they from? So I thought that was a useful construct. Then again, watching that tiger documentary they had a big segment there on his race well you know tiger's father was is black and his mother is asian but his father's parents were his father's mother was white and his father was black so tiger said i'm a quarter black and i'm a quarter asian and i'm a quarter white and he had some funny construction like i'm a cabal asian or whatever he, he announced when he Goblin was Asian, right? <laughs> yeah and uh, oprah's like what <laughs> <laughs> no, you're black. Come on, you're one of us. We need you, Tiger. We need you. And he says, I don't want to be the black golfer. I just want to be the golfer. And then they had Brian Gumble interviewed him, and he's like, it, it's one thing to think of what you think you are, but America thinks you're black. And to that extent, race matters of what it's real in other people's heads, even if it's not real for you or not real in, in nature in, in a scientific way. Yeah. And I think President Obama said something about how that what what you just described drove his identity toward black, where society is treating him this way, you know, and and, you know, as a kid and uh, and as an adult and and uh, that 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 because that is the perception that that structured his identity as his self-identification as black in a way that Tigers didn't didn't go in that direction. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, it's tricky. By the way, on the population thing, if I if I may plug the book a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. one of the co-authors, Quay Sean Spencer, who's at uh, University of Pennsylvania, um, are, tries to connect populations, biological, real biological populations, up with race as a way of biologically validating race. Now, I, I explain why I don't think that works, but I, I think there's some really interesting um, avenues to explore there for sure. What's the argument against that? What's your argument against that? Well, th so there are a few arguments. The one that I find most compelling is just that um, those populations aren't races. Um, part of that is is just in terms of if you look at who falls into the populations. So, for example, Barack Obama um, um, or Tiger Woods or whoever might get misclassified on on this view. And there's a prominent. So I think when we want to make sense of race, we want to make sense not of some you know, what's happening in a biological lab, but we want to make sense of race as we live it. We want to fix the racial strife we have. We want to, you know, walk back or repair the racial injustice that's been done in our society. And that means paying attention to our ordinary racial categories. And so I essentially argue that that Spencer's um, views don't quite capture that ordinary um, race that we live with, and it won't therefore speak to all the social problems we have. And so while I might you know, there might be these real populations out there. They're, they're maybe not going to ultimately vindicate race as we talk about it and practice it and suffer from it and so on. Yeah. I have a T-shirt that says, we're all Africans, which was I got from Richard Dawkins for his foundation. They were, you know, selling swag, and that was one of their pro-evolution things. And I threw it on the other day, and I was going to go out, uh, take my dog for a hike, and, and uh, looking at it going, huh. Maybe I don't want to wear this shirt now. You know, here's this white guy who says, you know, we're all black now. Or what is he trying to say? I was like, I'm not trying to say anything. <laughs> you know, I'm just pro-evolution. But, you know, it's become so highly charged that, you know, people are walking around. It really has. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's con disconcerting. You know, to I used to teach this stuff. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, you, 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 you speak. I was just going to say to your point about it's really hard to discuss. I used to teach this stuff to an all first year student, you know, they're all 18 year olds, basically, or 19 year olds. Um, and it's such a fraught topic that I, I moved the class to be a, a, for older, for, for more uh, advanced students, because it, it was too hard for them to talk about in, in an honest and open way, which you, you need to have that honesty, you need to have that vulnerability, you need to be able to risk saying something that's wrong, which in a context of discussing race can be, you know, socially penalized. Um, and so. Uh, it's a delicate, it's definitely a delicate, a delicate thing to talk about for sure. I wish we didn't have to talk about it. But why are we talking about it? Why does it matter? If it doesn't matter, then why are we talking about it? Well, because it does matter politically, I guess, or culturally still because of our history. Yeah. Uh, again, I, um, you know, my friend Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay, he's, he's the black astrophysicist. And he's, no, I'm an astrophysicist. I don't want to be the black astrophysicist. And he tells me that, you know, he, he gets contacted by, you know, black groups all the time. Oh, we want to give this award. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want an award because then I'm going to be the black astrophysicist. To me, that's the right approach for the long run. Just quit, you know, making that one of the characteristics by which you're assessing me. Just astrophysics. That's it. Period. Full stop. Or writing or whatever, but not the color of my skin. And yet we seem to be going the opposite direction uh, in terms of just because I know governments have to keep track of these things so they know what's going on and you know, for affirmative action programs and discrimination lawsuits and so on. So we got to know the data, but then you have to ask people, what is your color? <laughs> what race are you? And then we're back to talking about race again. That's right. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with your idea that in the long run, in the long run, things might, we might want things to be colorblind, but as long as we've got racism and the lingering effects of racism, we have to repair it. And that means we have to pay attention to, to race. I mean, we just can't can't walk down that path until we have fixed the problem. Because what you'll be doing is cementing that problem, right? You'll be you'll be entrenching a white supremacist social architecture, and you know that's that's not not a good thing. So, um, right. I I you know one of the other co-authors in the book, uh, Chike Jeffers, who's at Dalhousie in Canada, um, argues that that we should even keep race around after the end of racism for its cultural value. So. There's a lot of different positions in that book. If you know, for anyone who's interested, Heath, Heath, 
He argues that culture uh, can be not not isn't necessarily tied to race, but can be tied to race. And when it is, there's value there, and that value exists independently of whatever value exists in fighting racism. Oh, you mean like uh, sharing different cultures, music, and art, and food, and and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you get accused of cultural appropriation, <laughs> which is what all of culture is. Yeah, it's all appropriation. This is a recipe for, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a recipe for not culturally appropriate uh, against uh, appropriation. Say, let's keep this stuff. Yeah. Different groups. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not vibing that. I mean, to me, the richness of culture is the mixing up of it all. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you on that one. I don't, I. I certainly don't want to tie culture to race. I, even if we want different cultures, I think that tying it to race is, is not necessary. The yeah, moment. the last couple of years have been a little discouraging. From uh, you know, I wrote uh, the Moral Arc in 2015. I wrote it in 2014, published 2015, and then you know, it, it, tracking all the moral progress we've made on civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, animal rights, children's rights, workers' rights, and so on. It's been great over the centuries. But then, you know, all this stuff's coming out about the, you know, the Unite the Right and the and the Proud Boys and, and this crazy QAnon thing is our latest issue. I mean, these people are insane, but but it, but but there's a racial and anti-Semitic element to it. And it's like these people are they're really still out there. Maybe not tens of millions, but enough that it makes a difference. You know, most cops are not bigoted racists. They're, you know, they're pretty good people just trying to do the right. But there's enough of them. That should never have a badge and a gun. Uh, clearly, there's still issues there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I hesitate. Oh, yeah. to, I hesitate. Absolutely. I, I, I don't like the the idea of systemic because that kind of implies well, there's not much we can do about it other than defund the police or you know restructure the entire thing. When in fact, I I think it's just get rid of the bad apples, just have a better screening process or mm. something. Yeah, you know that's interesting. I have I well, I certainly. Um, think there are bad apples out there. I also think the system, I don't know if I, uh, you know, defund the police is so specific and it's a, it implicates so many different questions that it's um, hard to think of just, you know, isolate race um, within that lens. But when I think about it from the other angle of, you know, what forces have led to where we are now, it's pretty clear that some of them are institutional, right? Some of them are historical. They're not just bad apples. Yeah. I mean, the fact that, that so many um, is there's so much poverty in one community and mm. not another is directly traceable to our historical policies, um, whether that's genocide of Native Americans or slavery or any number of redlining. redlining there's so many yeah. pieces to this history. Yeah, and and I, I I don't I you get rid of all the bad apples and those those systemic inequalities still exist. Yeah. Now what the fix is is a, you know. Well, the fix would have to be, uh, again, systemic is too broad. If there's redlining, if some bank is not giving loans to African-Americans because they live in that neighborhood there instead of that one, then you go after that bank and go, hey, you can't do that. That's against the law. Here's the law. You can't do that. Nail that one rather than just say all bankers are racist or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely, yeah, we wouldn't want to leap from that to all bankers are racist. <laughs> yeah. um, but we might want to look at how like, the banking interacts with, say, media representations. And so, you know, banking policy with media representations of, of different minorities might lead to white flight or something mm. in the 1980s. And, and then, you know, because it's these different systems interacting, you can't just look at the one banker, I don't think. I think we got to right. take a 360 degree view of, of all of these things. And sometimes it's, a, you know, a you know, a really violent racist behind it. Sometimes it's it's a mistake. Sometimes it's ignorance. Like there's just so many forces behind it amongst the people involved. And I got to say, by the way, I'm, you know, so many of my students, when I talk to them about this, they, it just never occurred to them that like the media representations in the banking industry might converge mm, on, mm. And, and, and white homeowners' minds to change where white homeowners live. And then that changes the tax bases of the different communities and then the educational resources for white kids versus black kids are vastly different now. Yes. And um, I do think we need to, to, to attend to those kinds of, of systemic problems, um, not jump to all bankers are racist, but um, jump to we need, we need to evaluate everything and, and repair it on multiple levels. Yeah, that's a much harder problem because there you're, you're talking about going into deep history of like inherited wealth or multi-generational wealth. 
Um, you know, just the the kind of luck of being born white versus black or in a middle class neighborhood versus a poor neighborhood and the hundred different things that happen, a thousand or whatever, that send you down a different pathway and, and you know, there's no easy fix in there. There, I, I think there's an appeal to be made for the uh, UBI idea, although I'm not not 100% behind it because I don't know how you pay for it. But on the other hand, we just we just printed another two trillion dollars, <laughs> so maybe it is possible. That's right. One of my economist friends You've got lots of money. <laughs> We're just spending it elsewhere. Well, I I just asked a, on the ride yesterday. One of my guys is a um, uh, a financial advisor and an economist, and I said, "How are we going to be able to print another two trillion dollars without inflation?" You know, historically, every country that prints money like it's going out of fashion they have massive inflation he said because we're growing our economy grows so strong so rapidly that we can we can we could print a couple trillion more i'm like oh oh boy okay careful there <laughs> but you know maybe maybe uh sometimes i was gonna say sometimes the economic value increasing economic value seems like magic to me it, it does yes yes that. the power of compounding interest yeah no it's it's a remarkable thing yeah, there's a book called uh, Treconomics. It's about a kind of like a Star Trek world in which there's no money because everybody has everything they need. You just have these replicators. <laughs> you just order what you want. You know, Earl Grey hot, and you get the tea and the cup. It makes the cup too. <laughs> you know, so it's pretty much yeah, right. all the stuff you need. Uh, you, you don't really need money. Well, you know, we're a long ways from that. But on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of people that think we've hit peak stuff. Um, you know, just think of music, uh, you know, like I have all the, all the music I need right here. Whereas I used to have, you know, racks and racks of CDs. And before that it was, you know, shelves and shelves of, of, uh, long playing albums. And, you know, so peak stuff for, you know, automobiles, we probably hit that because now we're moving toward, you know, a, a more c commuter sharing c kind of uh, driving. And, um, you know, t I think we've hit peak oil uh because we're transitioning to electric cars now for example and so on so we may get there probably not in our lifetime anyway yeah. joshua we're way uh, off topic i know this is just kind of fun <laughs> to speculate on so, so what are you going to work on next what's next on your writing project or research project yeah my the, so i'm working on another book right now um and it's on being important um i am uh the book is going to argue uh a we're, the bad news is we're not important. <laughs> Who's the uh, we? The good news is that being important, being important is overrated. So don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, this is one of those things where philosophers have spent a lot of time talking about the good life and the meaningful life, um, but we haven't always drilled down on on things that people seem to care about. And being important is just such a big motivator for so many people who have so much power. Um, and I'm I want to I want to kind of take some of the steam out, out of that that impulse. Yeah, I would think since the presidential election just happened, you'd have to have a monumental drive to be that kind of important because the job doesn't pay all that well, relatively speaking. Every almost everybody hates yeah. you. <laughs> Half the country hates your guts and wants you dead. Half your party doesn't like you. They're only kissing your ass because they want jobs in your administration. Right. It's like who would want that job? So that's a that's a unique kind of personality. And everybody comes out of it. They all look so you know like they've aged three times as long as they've been in office. Right? Yeah, just yeah, a massively stressful job. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But you mean something more too, um, right? Like a, a, the drive for status and reputation in a community. No, I actually want to. I mean, so I I, I also think those things are overrated. Uh, but I want to take. I want to. I want to set those aside. Money and fame and love from the massive, you know, being a celebrity or whatever, and focus on um, just being important. If you could do something really, you know, if you could cure cancer, but mm. you wouldn't get the credit for it, it would go to the guy who runs your lab instead of you. Um, but you'd be the one to do it. Mm. Um, would you want, would it matter to you that you be the one to cure cancer as opposed to the person working at the next lab table? It's mm. that kind of question that I want to zero Interesting. With. And I think we, we do. I mean, I was certainly raised, I mean, I, I have this I had at least, or I'm working, this is me working through this, but I, you know, this, this idea that if you keep all else equal, sure, you'd rather be president or a senator or whatever than just to be a random, you know, everyday kind of person. Um, but, and I think, I think that's rampant in, in America, that kind of thinking. And I want to, I want to, I want to put the screws to it. I, I think that there's not a lot of good reason to think that. So 
Anyway, that's what the next book is. No, you're, you're making me think about this here. But you, you do want to be important, say, to your spouse or your family member or your best friends. Because that's kind of what it means to have a best friend, is you're important to them. Yes, that's right. Yeah, best friend who doesn't care about you. Yeah, be it's like, well, yeah. my BFF who doesn't give a shit. What? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, so when I say we're not important, um, I I mean that in, a, in a, the cosmic sense. Of, oh, oh. You know, you look up at the stars and you think we're just dust floating. You know, we're just sort of sophisticated dust for a brief moment of time. And and it, we don't really matter. And I think a lot of a lot of actually, I mean, this isn't probably going to be part of the book, but I have this this speculation, this hypothesis that a lot of the bad, really bad stuff that has been done by political leaders is because of a need to fight that cosmic unimportance and try to mm. you know create some sort of mark on the on the universe. And it's it's a even if even put aside all the moral problems with that. It's just a futile project. It's not going to. So I'm arguing there's really no way to make sense of us being cosmically. You, you, you mean I, I want to live on and through my work, achieve immortality yeah. through the, the impact I make, something like that. That's right. Yeah. That's what Horace said, right? He said, with, right. with, with my poetry, I have created a monument greater than anything in stone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> of course, when you're in the grave, it doesn't matter, but, <laughs> but yeah. you're. But but now you but but when you're living you think that that legacy matters. This reminds me actually another uh, one of my essays in Scientific American was called Alvy's Error. Alvy was Alvy Singer, Woody Allen's character in um, ah, Annie sure. Annie Hall, where he has the flashback as a child and his mother takes him to the psychiatrist because he won't do his homework. And why won't you do your homework? He says the world is ex the universe is expanding. What? Because one day the universe is going to all blow up, so none of this matters. And his mother upbraids him and says, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn's not expanding. <laughs> so perspective <Right>. there. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to hunt down your that piece because that's that's the kind of thing I want to talk about. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are fun. Uh, I like it when authors put uh, pop culture references, so I always do that because that kind of – lightens it up a little bit, but also gives you an example that immediately pops the principle into the for, forefront of your mind. Well, Joshua, thanks for, for coming on. We've been going on for, for over an hour and a half, and it's a great conversation. Really enjoyed this, and uh, I love your work, and uh, I look forward to reading the next one. That'll be great. We'll have you back. Thank you, Michael. I'm a, I'm a big fan, and I, it was an honor and a pleasure to, to speak.